in the case of Boot Hill, one of my first projects was a Boot Hill project, and the characters were pretty much, you know, how well you shoot and what your what weapon you're carrying, and and you know, trying to populate a town where everyone is armed is kind of kind of a bit of a challenge. So I'm really interested in what some of the big challenges you faced when working on D20 Modern. Things that either you had to go back and readdress over and over again as playtesting went forward, or things that were just very difficult to decide in the first place. So, uh, Rich, maybe you could start on this question. I think for, for me, other than things that we've already talked about, for me, the challenge was how much can we change from core d20 because i was all i had already reached a point where i was like it's dumb that spot and listen are two different skills we should just have one and have it be perception and hide and move silently should just be a stealth skill and we should just move on with that but those were that's too big a change it starts to make things incompatible and so those were sort of boundaries that i banged off of uh, a couple of times. And, you know, it was just a learning process. Like, like we've said before, there's, it didn't create any hard, it created some frustration at the time, but it didn't create any lasting hard feeling. It's just, you had to know what the boundaries were. And that was how I found them by banging off of them. So I guess for me, the initial challenge was what to do with the class race balance, right. And, and coming up with the, the uh, classes based on attributes uh, once that clicked, everything else kind of fell into place, uh, at least for the general system. Then how much of the rule system to repeat? What did we actually need to put in this book so you could play, uh, but we didn't necessarily have to pull over whole cloth from one of the other D20 books? Mm. Um, and, and that was just a matter of, you know, what fit and what didn't fit. Um, and then obviously things like, you know, places where I don't have expertise and where I brought in Rich and Charles to help with like weapons and vehicles and, and uh, the more techie stuff that isn't my uh, cup of tea as it were. Right. So uh, uh, knowing where I needed help and then getting that help. How about you, Charles? Um, you know, I think we've like, what Bill was saying is an awful lot about like, how do we, like Bill was talking about the, the, the character classes or whatnot. Like how do we make this, generic and cover so many different genres um, and not, you know, not have one particular genre in mind when we do it, make sure that everything we, we do will work for everything that our players might want to do. But I also think another thing that, that it's easy to lose sight of is the fact that this was, we were coming right on the heels of the publication of 3.0 and, and we were about a year ahead of 3.5. So as Rich was saying, there's, there was already thinking going on about like, you know, reviewing things that were that existed in 3.0 and asking ourselves if that was really the most streamlined or the best way of, of doing things. And I know if I remember correctly, um, 3.5's reworking of the language, not the rules, but the language of um, attacks of opportunity, I think came out of work that we did on, on D20 Modern. So I think we were thinking a lot about, as Rich said, where those boundaries were and like what, what was worth reviewing and, and, and seeing that merge into where D and D was the, the the core game, Jeff. Well, I, I think we've talked about it a number of times before, but it's about scope and believability. I think it's the idea that we are uh, if, we're, if we're doing D and D, we are simulating a fantasy uh, medieval universe, and so you know there's a lot of tropes that are just assumed. But we have a real world outside, and people can make comparisons. And you know if if this doesn't line up. 100% with, you know, what happens in the real world. The wealth system is a very good example. It's it just like, but is it believable enough to carry us forward and for people to say, yes, I can buy that as a simulation? That also gave us certain advantages, though, because we didn't have to describe what a modern city looked like or what right. a shopping center looked like or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a big difference with a modern genre is we all know the world. Right. Uh, it's just a question of right. what do we do with it? How does it impact the game? 
Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm interested in that dynamic of uh you know you're working on a D20 game, but you're also making a new game, and so where you know I think this is a, a question to start for you, Bill. Like, where were you willing to push the boundaries? Where were you willing to make changes? And where were you not? Where did fidelity become the most important factor? That everything would still be compatible. So we wanted to not change so much that they didn't look like the they came from the same source anymore. Uh, but uh, I was willing to, and and we did it, although I'd have to try to go back in and figure out where we made those changes. Like I said, my goal was to make it simpler uh, where we could, uh, streamline it where we could, adjust it to make sense for the genres we were using uh, where we could. Um, and it all came down to... Uh, uh, we knew where all the knobs were, and we would turn them a little bit each time until we finally said, that's close, or that's good enough. Um, stop touching that dial. Because <laughs> at some point, we're working to deadline, right? You know, we did not have the right. ability to uh, spend years and years and years before this would get published. I think we had like nine to 12 months was probably our, our window. Uh, that's usually what our windows were for these kind of products. Uh, so my goal as kind of the gatekeeper was to keep us moving. And that meant, you know, this knob is now where it needs to be. We'll look at it if something else happens, but let's move to this knob now. Right? So. Yeah, I think that's a common challenge. You know, I know as a, as a designer, I find every time I go back and look at something, I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, now that I look at it, a year later, <laughs> I see this, 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 you know, or thinking I could have tuned up at the time. So the time pressure can be hard. Um, were there times you found that you just kept changing something or uh, that you didn't have enough time to go back and, and you're kind of like, oh, well, uh, do you remember any particular parts that you had pressure like that on? Not really. I mean, we had all done this numerous times already. So we were used to the deadline this ca uh, uh, cadence. Mm -hmm. um, but we would make some changes a few times. There was num numerous versions of those early drafts, especially of the character creation chapter, probably went through a number of iterations. Firearms, obviously. Uh, places that didn't change as much was the Game Master chapter, the uh, uh, the chapter on uh, campaign models kind of just flew out of us, uh, uh, with the exception of the one we, we moved over to the... <laughs> <laughs> but but move on, uh, move on. Uh, uh, it's always something to keep an eye on and it, you know that's kind of my role uh, not just as the lead for this particular product but as the director of the, the department was make sure that the team has what it needs to hit these deadlines and to move through the system as quickly and as efficiently as we could yeah i, I think for this project we came in standing up as opposed to in that we did have uh, the documents, we did have every, the turnover, we knew what the package was, we had gone back and gotten more pages in order to, to basically fill everything we had. Uh, it was tight. Uh, I've definitely been responsible for projects that did not do this. And this was one that basically did come together very nicely. What would you say in general for role-playing games is the most if you're making a core rule book, so you're making the whole game, what's the most challenging element of an RPG to come up with? Is it core mechanic? Is it the flavor? What would you say is, is the point that um, you struggle the most over when you're launching into a new project? If we're starting from scratch, mm -hmm. the core mechanics are always the toughest, yeah. uh, I think, uh, especially if you're trying to build a brand new system. That that's always going to be your biggest challenge. Um, the flavor of the of the of the setting and the world, that's not easy, but it's not quite the same as the mechanical challenge of making a fun and understandable game system that hasn't been done before. I might argue also that scope is can be a challenge too. I mean, sometimes you come into a game with a very very clear vision of what you want, and that's that's really easy then to to, to focus around that. But but sometimes, and I think with D20 Modern, it was you know, part of the challenge is you're trying to build a game that can do a lot, right? And then deciding how it prioritizes what it does or making sure that it does everything. Um, that, I think that can also be a pretty big challenge. 
I, I'm going to go with, you know, with, you know um, making the game understanding, as Bill has said, yeah, understandable. Uh, there's an accessibility type thing. When people are coming into the game, how are they going to encounter it for the first time? Are they going to start on page one and read through? Are they going to browse through? Are they going to play in someone else's campaign? Or are they going to see something on uh, YouTube? You know, And all of this... It depends on how they we expose them to the game and how we, yes, this is something you want to play. So I'll tell you that a huge challenge for modern games in particular, and, and I think some sci-fi games on top of that, is what's the hamster wheel? The hamster wheel in fantasy games is I go out, I go out, and I kill more monsters, I kill monsters, and I get treasure and experience so that I can kill tougher monsters and get better treasure and better experience. Mm -hmm. And you're constantly on that hamster wheel ingrained in fantasy gaming that we don't even really have to talk about it anymore. Everybody knows that's what you're going to do, but what's the hamster wheel for the modern game? How are you going to, what's the motivation to keep going, to keep going back out there and facing these otherworldly horrors and, and, or, or, saving the world from nuclear annihilation or whatever it is that you're doing, you know, and I think in, oddly enough, I think in post-apocalyptic games, the goal of survival is so clear and so well understood that th those games work really well. But in a lot of other games, it's just, what, why, why are we, why do we keep doing this? And you need to, in, in my opinion, the answer should be from character background. It should come out of the personal goals of the character and how those get advanced while they're going through these adventures. Well, also has a tendency for genre as well. The old top secret game, its uh, cycle was basically you get a mission, you basically complete the mission, you get a new mission. So basically that's the, you know, the cycle for that sort of thing. For an apocalyptic game, it's survival. You basically go out, face trade. Uh, dangers and you basically have a little more security as far as going forward so basically i think that is tied much more to genre necessarily of what you're simulating what you're basically trying to uh, display in the game as you design it all right uh you know since i have you gentlemen here i'm curious i think influence is always an important part of design and any kind of creative process so some of the really early games in a in a modern or semi-modern setting we've got um uh top secret uh, Boot Hill are a couple that come to mind. I'm sure there's probably some more. I'm not remembering because uh, there's always a lot more games than anybody can read. But can you tell me about some of the other games that were influential in your thinking when you were putting it together, either consciously or subconsciously? Uh, maybe, Jeff, you could start. In the case of Boot Hill, one of my first projects was a Boot Hill project. And the characters were pretty much, you know, how well you shoot and what your what weapon you're carrying. And and, you know, trying to populate a town where everyone is armed is kind of, kind of a bit of a challenge. Um, it's evolved and it's changed later editions, added a lot more to it. Uh, for Top Secret, it, uh, it basically had, it had the first, like, fate point, re-roll roll type point uh, that you could use as far as to make it more heroic in nature. Uh, but both of those played well within their genre. And what we're doing in D20 Modern is spreading that out. We're trying to cap cap be able to capture those plus science fiction, plus modern cops, plus Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So basically, in building a strong, broad base, it allowed us to be able to do those types of games. Makes sense. Uh, anybody else? Inspirations? You know, we were building a game that was uh, more of a toolbox than a genre, as, as we've said a few times. Um, so not so much for inspiration, but I certainly looked at things like GURPS, uh, Torg, other game systems that were broader than a single, uh, our own alternative, uh, that were broader than a single uh, genre, just to see how they approached it. Uh, you know, Boot Hill, uh, I had I had played that mostly as a line them up and have gunfights game, not as an RPG. I wasn't sure how to run, and this is before I was a professional, how to run a Western RPG. I don't remember the game's giving me a lot of advice on that. Uh, but it worked great as uh, could Jesse James beat Billy the Kid? Let's find out. Uh, and certainly we took some of that into, we at least looked at that as we were developing, you know, any firearms, you're going to look at previous firearms to see how they did it. 
But beyond that, I was really looking at what did we do with D&D third edition and how could we metamorphosize it into what we needed to do a modern game that branched modern to far future. Right. And there were other things out there in the D20 space, right? Both internally and externally. We had already done the Call of Cthulhu D20 right. version, or I can't, as Bill pointed out, I can't remember if that was came out ahead of us or after, but it would certainly have been worked on before that. Um, and then you had Spycraft that AEG came out with, which was a fairly successful spy-based uh, uh, D20 game. But as Bill said, I think that we had so much of our own goals and our own material in the in our internal D and D sphere and the, the the D twenty sphere that like I I don't really recall looking to other games to solve to to, to find inspiration for solving problems or or whatnot. Uh, they were certainly there, but insofar as they did anything, it, and, and here I'm talking about both internal stuff and external, it was more like looking at what they did and saying, ah, that's not right for what we want. We're trying to do something different here. It's the modern world. It, we wanted it to reflect as as realistically as we could the people that exist in that world. And that's everybody. <laughs> oh. <laughs>